Is China's economy stalling or are some just hoping it will? Despite the paradoxical lack of confidence in the world's second largest economy, the IMF recently revised China's 2024 economic growth forecast to 5% up from 4.6% in April. The IMF noted the revision was in part based on stronger consumption figures during the first quarter along with stronger exports. This month, making good on pledges to further expand opening up, China announced its latest negative list for foreign direct investment, cutting the number of restricted industries on the national level from 31 to 29. The move, which goes into effect on November the 1st, will completely lift all restrictions in China's manufacturing sector. This leads us to ask, what is the real economic situation on the ground? Is China's economy headed in the right direction? Why should investors be still optimistic about the future? Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you from the headquarters of the IMF office here in Beijing. I'm Li Xin. I'm pleased to be joined by Stephen Allen Barnett, senior resident representative in China of the IMF. Mr. Barnett, welcome to The Point. And thank you for making yourself available during your very busy schedule. Let's start with China's latest uh, policy on removing um, the remaining obstacles in terms of investment, foreign investment in the manufacturing sector. On September the 8th, China uh, released the 2024 edition of the negative list for foreign investment access and lifting the last two restrictions in terms of manufacturing for foreign direct investment. And that's going to go in effect on November the 1st of this year. What do you think of this policy and what's going to be the impact? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, first, thank you very much for having me here. It's really a, a pleasure uh, to be here today. Now, to your question, when we look at uh, foreign direct investment, you know, I like to think of this in the context of China's reform and opening up more broadly. Mm -hmm. And clearly, opening up, allowing investment to come in, has been a key driver of growth by creating competitive business environment. So eliminating restrictions, you could think of as a necessary condition to attract investment in those sectors at the so risk of So it's long overdue, you would say. Well, I don't know if it's long overdue. There's been a gradual process of opening up to more and more sectors. But mm. I, I think a key point here is opening up maybe is a necessary condition, but to actually attract the investment, it's going to be really important to have a really strong business environment. So maybe just two aspects there. One, a business environment, and actually to quote the government, that is a world-class business environment that's market-oriented and law-based. This will help attract the actual foreign investment. I think the second part, also from the government uh, work report, a level playing field so that private firms, state-owned firms, and foreign invested firms mm. all can compete on a level playing field. Yeah. So this would be one step in the right direction, at least for the moment? What would you say? Sure, I think that's fair. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, it, it depends on how um, these policies are implemented, I guess you would. Right, and I tend to view it in a, in, a, in a broader context of the whole reform and opening up strategy. You know, we can look back in time, the attraction of foreign investment or allowing foreign investors to come in has been a key factor supporting growth. And sometimes it's not just the investment, that might actually be relatively small, but it helps drive a more competitive market. It makes the local firms more competitive. Mm. So in the end, the whole industry benefits and really in the end, the consumers benefit because mm. they get access to more products. So are you talking about a more symbolic significance of the moves and the, the message that China is sending to the world that it wants to go further down along this road of, you know, attracting um, overseas expertise, best practices and so on and so forth? I think I almost put it in context. If we go back, there's been a steady movement of reform and opening up. We can go back to the 80s or probably even earlier. But uh, I first came to China in 2003. So I would go back to that time and we can see the, the role that this whole strategy of reform and opening up. So I guess I view it in that context, maybe more important than any single measure is the general direction of policies. Mm. And the general direction of the policy has been consistent, I hope probably comes in waves of more or less opening up. I think one thing we've noticed lately, we just recently had you know, the second quarter data for foreign direct investment. And 
for the only the second quarter that I can recall, the other one being, a, a, I think just a, a few quarters ago, that we had actually negative FDI into China. Mm -hmm. So that, we can come back to that, has to do with a lot of factors. But right. that, uh, I think uh, that's why I tend to look at things in the broader context of creating a very good business environment. So reducing restrictions is obviously important. Mm -hmm. Creating a good business environment is arguably maybe even more important. <laughs> I understand what you're saying. Okay, another question which is um, in the policy direction, or maybe in the general strategy uh, sense, is this term of uh, creating a high-level market economy system mm -hmm. to advance Chinese modernization. Basically, some of the key tenets you mentioned already. Right. Um, this was promulgated during the third plenum of mm -hmm. the recent um, um, CPC Central Committee meeting. Um, what do you think of the idea of China now touting a Chinese modernization in, for the IMF? What kind of implication does that have? Right. I think when, when we look at growth as an economist, as an IMF economist, as any economist, uh, over the medium term, really three things drive growth. You can add more capital, so more factories for the sake of argument. You can add more labor or you can use the capital and labor better. And we call that third one productivity. So let's take the case of China. The capital stock in China is already high. It can mm. still continue to grow. The working age population in China, the labor force, has already started to go down in terms of absolute numbers. This is just demographics. Mm -hmm. So growth is gonna increasingly have to rely on this use it better, the productivity. And so when we look at the language in the third plenum, and the language in the government work report, you know, as an economist, it was great to see, you don't see too many government work reports that actually explicitly mentioned total factor productivity, which is a technical term, I'm saying productivity, uh, both the plenum resolution and uh, Premier Lee's work report had that in there. And so that is the right recipe for generating growth, boosting productivity. And I think they cite four reforms that are actually also the same reforms that we would agree are, are critical for achieving this. And you know, the first is to give the market a decisive role in the allocation of resources. Markets are really good at putting resources where they yield the most productivity. Mm. Two of them we already talked about. One is creating a level playing field between all types of firms. All right. The third is a business environment. And then the fourth that they also mentioned is the uh, can, between provinces, removing barriers between provincial trade. Uh, uh, a general market, national market. Yeah, national market, yes. Okay, yes. okay. And that, you know, that's the right recipe, and that'll help generate the kind of mm. productivity growth, which in the end is going to generate growth in the economy uh, mm. in, the, in the long run. Um, rather, we were paying attention to the new quality productivity forces. I, I'm sure you've heard. Um, there were a lot of hype, a lot of uh, attention uh, analysis on this new term because it's just been rolled out this year. Um, do you think there, there is a critical link between the two sides or they're really not, not really the same? I, mean, I guess I, what I would come back, I mean, at the end of the day, if growth is driven by total factor productivity, then the rules of economics are the same. So what's going to drive growth in the Chinese economy is the ability to generate economy-wide gains and total factor productivity. Markets tend to find the places where resources get the highest returns. So when we see language like give the market the decisive role in the allocation mm -hmm. of resources, my macroeconomic brain says that's a way to generate economy-wide productivity. Well, here precisely the, the Chinese modernization um, question come into play because um, um, it, it seems that letting market decide for everything has not worked all the time too well for every <laughs> country and that's why China wants to have its own recipe you know of course market plays a very important role probably the more important decisive role but there has to be the role of the state which has proven to be effective at least in China's case yeah, I mean thinking all economies of course there's a balance you need regulations we need laws but you know, I look back at China's own history, and let's start just in the 90s for sake of argument. Mm. You know, how did, China's had remarkable economic growth from the 1990s. In fact, if you plot a simple chart of growth rates by income, China's off the charts. No country 
in this period has seen similar average annual growth rates. So we ask, how did China achieve this? And you know, one of the keys is, again, I come back to reform and opening up, but let me link this exactly to your question. We can see in the late 1990s, there was SOE reform, which those of us around at the time know was quite difficult. Yeah. Many, many millions of workers laid off, very, very difficult. Then China acceded to the WTO. Now that looks easy at the time, that wasn't easy to do. No. There was a lot of questions about whether that would help China or not. That combination, and we look in the 2000s, virtually all of the job creation in China was private sector manufacturing. The combination of reform of the SOE sector, joining WTO and allowing the private sector to thrive meant all of these workers went from farming to factories. And just think about how much a worker produces in one month on a farm versus one month in a factory. Think it. That generates huge productivity gains, generated huge income growth. That's economists speak. That generated huge gains in living standards. People's living standards went up significantly, and China was able to eradicate extreme poverty. So I think that's an example of how economy-wide reforms really helped propel economy-wide growth. The IMF revised the China projection for, for the year 2024 up from 4.6% to 5% yeah. in line of what you, probably in line with what you just, is that right. what's uh, behind the readjustment or the upticking of China's? Yeah, I mean, the, the key part of the upgrade in the forecast, which we really did in May when we were here for our annual consultation, is, as you know, we went from 4.6 to 5%, really reflected developments that had happened. Q1 was uh, stronger than we thought. And you know, the key factor has been strong consumption. In Such fact, as? Mm. Uh, well, so strong consumption, even if we go back even to last year, to 2023, you know, consumption explained 80% of growth in 2023. First quarter, we saw a similar development. So stronger consumption. We also saw stronger uh, mm. export numbers. So on the backs of that, we upgraded our forecast for the entire year to 5%, broadly reflecting what we had seen. Through the second quarter, we've seen a similar story where consumption is still the single largest contributor to growth. So consumption for the first half of the year together, consumption explained about 60% of growth. And I think a key challenge going forward and a key opportunity is to keep that pattern up, to keep mm. having consumption being the key driver of growth. Mm. Sure, sure. Well, um, but according to the IMF, this revision was in part based on stronger consumption numbers in the first quarter of this year and stronger exports right. also. Um, what are possibly driving this trend? Because some people are talking about uh, a sluggish consumption. Right. Even the Chinese government used the word insufficient. Right. Uh, from what basis is the IMF drawing the observation? The problem, if you can call it a problem, is that GDP the denominator grew faster than consumption, but both have grown really, really fast. So from 2000 to 2019, consumption in China grew incredibly fast. It's just GDP grew even faster. And as a result, consumption was falling as a share of GDP. Definitely we saw a rebound. Again, consumption in the first half of the year explained 60% of growth. Uh, we should be a little careful in interpreting that because if we would go back to 2023, remember the first quarter of 2023 was still feeling some of the after effects of the pandemic. Okay, so, we so call the, these baseline, was, the baseline was, low. was very low. Yes, exactly. Okay. So I think that probably next to productivity, the, the other key challenge for the Chinese economy is to sustain this pattern, mm. to sustain where consumption is going to drive growth. And I think to achieve that really is going to require some supportive policies. Yeah, yeah. Well, the IMF predicts that um, um, not only uplifted the, the projection for this year, you also predicts that China's economy is going to grow about 4.5% in next year, which is an upward revision of 0. 4 percentage point right. as well, um, again driven by strong QI, Q1 GDP data and recent policy measures. So. Um, there are certain elements of optimism, optimism that the IMA picked up from the policy announcements or rollout of latest policies. Sure, which is you could say in May when we made these upgrades that mm. was reflecting the developments to date and our views on the, the policy outlook. And then in July, when we published our next update, the numbers stayed the same. So okay. what we had seen in between. What, ha what happened? 
<laughs> they stayed the same. So we, I guess we were right. The numbers are broadly in line with, with what we expected. But again, we won't come out with new forecasts until October. Mm. I think we're all looking for the Q3 GDP numbers, which also we won't get to. Yeah, I want to stick with stronger consumption okay. once again. I'm sorry sure. because I don't get to talk to the chief economist or chief uh, resident Rep, yeah. <laughs> representative yeah. of the IMF in China very often. So um, you talk about stronger consumption, okay, against a, a, a lower baseline. Is that why some people are saying the perception of the Chinese economy is not as good as the numbers looking? Yeah, this is a really, really good question. So if we look at, as I was arguing, the consumption growth by and large has been driving overall growth in China in, the, in 2023 and in the first half of 2024. This lines up against very, very low consumer confidence. So if we look at surveys of consumer confidence reflecting this mood that you're saying, mm. uh, it's been low in China. Now what's interesting, if you look globally, uh, confidence after the pandemic fell. So let's take the US as an example. U.S. has had a very strong consumption recovery. We can talk about why, but it ha it's just a fact. Yet confidence also in the U.S. was below normal. So it seemed, and same thing in Europe, we've seen confidence below normal. So when I look at consumer confidence, I like to frame it this way because we've seen this general trend globally. But what China stands out for is before the pandemic, consumer confidence was really much stronger than these other places. Mm. And if we look today, it's lower. So the decline in confidence in China mm -hmm. has been lower. Now, that each case, there's country-specific factors. I think China, you know, the developments in the real estate market uh, clearly uh, are important. Again, 90% of urban households own a home. And so virtually every urban household is affected by the correction in the real estate market. And that clearly is weighing on confidence. Mm. Um, you were talking about the comparison of the confidence level between mm -hmm. China and other economies, which, which, is, uh, which led me to ask you this question. Uh, okay, okay, you know, we shouldn't be uh, comparing numbers. We shouldn't right. be comparing anything, right. <laughs> basically. But again, people like to compare, you know. Right. What does the 5% or 4.6% mean for the global economy? Because China last year, according to the IMF, right. contributed to half, right, together with India. China, exactly. China contributed to one third. R roughly one third. Roughly yeah. run one third. So what would that mean if China is on target for about 5% this year? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's a great point. China contributed last year and this year around 30% of global growth each year. Uh, you know, China is the world's second largest economy in US dollar terms. When IMF aggregates growth, we actually don't use US dollars. We use purchasing power parity weights. Or so PPP. it's number one. It's number one in PPP weights. So mm. clearly what happens in China has a huge impact on the global economy. So at a time that the global economy really could use a lift, it's really important that uh, growth, uh, growth in China is not only good for China, mm. it also provides this welcome lift to the global economy. Mm. That leads me to another question because some people, uh, some, you know, even uh, economists have been um, talking about uh, the IMF has a research which actually says one percentage in the Chinese economic growth or GDP yeah. it leads to 0.3 percent of uh, output for other economies. Um, help us understand that a little yeah, bit better yeah, yeah. because we don't, you know, understand. <laughs> I don't understand economics so much. But what does that mean? Sure, that, no, that's a great point. In that, you know, generally, faster growth in one economy usually has spot positive spillovers, has positive effect on others. In really simple terms, as China grows faster, it's going to import more from other countries, mm. which means other countries can produce more to sell into China, and that's the positive spillover. So when I tell you China accounts for 30% of global growth, that's just a mechanical effect. The numbers you quoted, every one percentage point faster growth in China, on average leads to 0.3% increase in output in other countries over time. That's the second effect. That's the spillovers from faster growth in China. In simple terms, drawing in uh, more imports. And I think we need to look, what's the state of the global economy to understand the importance of faster growth in China? Growth in the global economy has been running pretty steady at about three and a quarter percent, 3.2, 3.3, depending on the year. That is slow. In the two decades before the pandemic, global growth averaged 3.8%. So from 3.8%, we have a global economy now moving at 
a steady rate of around three and a quarter. Our medium term forecast for the global economy is the lowest we've had in decades. It's below three and a quarter percent. We need all engines of the global economy firing. Mm -hmm. So China, using our numbers, the world's number one economy or number two in US dollar terms, it's really important that strong growth in China mm. has both effects, mechanically lifting the numbers and this positive spillover effect that, that you described. Of course, of course. Um, but China um, has said, uh, according to a recent high-level meeting, China has said that you know, the adverse external environment is severe plus the insufficient domestic consumption. So what are the external risks that the IMF is seeing mm -hmm. for the growth of the Chinese economy? Um, and what kind of risks should Chinese sure. domestic producers or policymakers be preparing them for? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, first, I like how you mentioned domestic consumption. I promise I'll get to the risks, but I think you know, the number one in the near term is you know, policies to support domestic consumption in China. Uh, anything from tax reforms to increasing pensions, ultimately boosting domestic consumption uh, will help insulate against all other risks. But let me come to your question on the geopolitical External risks. risks. External risks, sure. I think that you know, at the fund, we've really been focused on the costs of economic fragmentation. We've done research that shows that in an extreme scenario of economic, geoeconomic fragmentation, the world could lose 7% of output. Think about that. The world economy could be 7% smaller. Mm. And that's just from trade fragmentation. We've done research looking at technology decoupling. That could cost some economies 5% of output. We've done research on fragmentation in commodity markets, fragmentation in foreign direct investment. And the message of all this work is the same, that geoeconomic fragmentation is potentially very costly. So, you know, what's the policy message is rather than fragmentation, we need to again make trade an engine of growth globally. Mm. Well, um, my impression is that China has been talking about trade, trade, trade. Don't decouple, don't de-link, don't right, de-risk. Right. Whereas, um, you know, we have seen, I'm sure it's open, you know, it's no secret that uh, there's been all kinds of um, call to de-risk, decouple, even, and tariffs. We, mm -hmm. We've seen tariffs, you know, putting, very high tariffs against Chinese products. I'm not trying to ask you to take si sides here right. or criticize any particular, yeah, yeah. but it's true. We're seeing these, right? China says, let's trade, let's trade, open up. But uh, it seems that uh, um, it's unable to do that. Yeah, let me, let me take two aspects of this. You know, one, I think the fund has been very vocal globally that uh, the need to reinvigorate global trade uh, the first step is to roll back many of the restrictions put in place. And instead, countries should sit down and discuss the concerns at the heart of recent trade disputes. They should strengthen, sit down and work together to strengthen the multilateral trading system with the WTO at its core. So I think yeah. that's one aspect. But I, th I think there's another aspect that the fund has been looking at and been putting much more weight on recently. Again, for our consultations with all of our countries is industrial policy. And it's clear that China also has industrial policies, or rather extensive industrial policies. And we would argue that you know, in certain cases these are appropriate, but in general, industrial policies have two unwanted consequences. They can misallocate resources. Mm. And second, they have spillovers to trading partners. And we've done research to show how you know, supporting an industry globally and supporting industries in China has impacts on China's trading partners. And we've done, if we look not just at the industry supported, but if you look at upstream industries, if you count all the support, then you find even bigger impact on trading partners. So I think the, the world needs to sit down and discuss this. It's, it's clear that the industrial policies, I, I use China because I focus on China. We could make the same argument for industrial policy in any country, but it has implications for trading partners. So I think there are issues here that the uh, world needs to sit down and, and, and work through. Mm. Well, it seems that uh, the world is not ready to sit down. <laughs> they're taking actions, <laughs> you know, they're putting tariffs there as high as 100%. On, uh, I, I, I don't know what, what went wrong and looking from the IMF, doesn't it worry you that instead of um, coming together, they're 
going their ways. Yeah, their different ways. I think if you look at the sequence of research I cited from the IMF, I, there's a consistent theme of all of this research is to remind the world what are the economic costs of geoeconomic fragmentation, that it's costly. Mm. And I think we've been quite consistent and we're also putting a roadmap forward again. You know, there, we could strengthen the WTO to cover areas of the modern economy that weren't covered, whether it's the coverage of investment or things like e-commerce or services. There's right. many areas where we should strengthen the multilateral trading system and that hopefully would address some of these uh, concerns. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think China absolutely sees the importance of foreign direct investment. Otherwise, it wouldn't be rolling out the latest policies. Um, but I guess I have to, I really have to ask this question because outside of China, especially in the news, in the media, there has been a lot of talk of who killed the Chinese economy, for instance, that the Chinese economy is ailing, is failing, and so on and so forth. To be really fair, Mr. Barnett, yeah. <laughs> I need a straightforward line. Has the Chinese economy been killed? Let me let the numbers speak. Yeah. The Chinese economy grew 5.2% last year. 5%, we forecast 5% this year and 4.5% next year. Uh, among the fastest growing economies in the world. I think you know, perceptions matter here, perspective. You know, China used to grow much faster. So it is true that the Chinese economy has been slowing down. Mm -hmm. I think it's also fair to say that the Chinese economy is facing uh, challenges. But our forecasts account for these challenges, but that, uh, you know, I've, I've first came, I first moved to China for the first time in 2003. And my time in China has been, let's set aside the pandemic year, seen just phenomenal growth rates. Uh, kids born, when I came in 2003, only know a China that grows really, really fast. And nowhere in the world is that sustainable forever. So I think what we're seeing is an adjustment from mm. very fast growth rates. To borrow language from the government, I hope what we see is an adjustment to higher quality uh, growth. It may be slower. And I think two dimensions of quality, one we talked about fueled by productivity gains. One is really, really important. The other one we haven't talked about, which is really important for China, and really important for the world is, is that it's environmentally friendly. And, you know, China has set the climate goals of 2030 carbon peak and 2060 right. uh, carbon neutrality. I mean, this is just so important both, again, for China and, and the world economy. Yeah. And I think it also leads to a really, really important point that I failed to say on trade, that for so many of these global problems, there's only one way to solve it, and that's for the world to work together. We need international cooperation. No one country can solve the trade issues. No one country can solve the climate problem. I mean, we share this planet. We have to work together. Mm. Well, it's such a optimistic yeah. and uh, important message. I have to wrap the <laughs> conversation up here because I believe in that too. Thank you Great. so much, Mr. Bennett. Thank you.